Hello, everyone, and welcome to NTTBF and this Spotlight program. Today, I'm delighted to um, chat with Ransom Riggs, author of The Desolation of Devil's Acre, the final installment in Miss Peregrine's Peculiar Children series. Ransom, I'm going to screw this up probably multiple times. I'm so sorry. That's a mouthful. And by the way, I'm Rose Brock. Um, I am um, a children's literature professor at Sam Houston State University and one of the co-founders of NTTBF. And Ransom, we're excited you were with us today. Welcome back to NTTBF. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Is it my turn to talk? Should I say lots of things now? I'm super happy to be here. <laughs> we love that. That makes us happy. It's not like an intro. I wasn't sure if to jump in or what's going on. You can absolutely, you know, we're just talking here. We're just talking. Yeah. So, you know, I, okay. my first question was really just about this crazy, peculiar uh, children's world of, of, of um, the peculiar children. Now I can't talk. Oh, goodness. It is the end of the day and you can tell. <laughs> I'm going to let you talk. Tell us about... You know, I know it's not a particularly creative question, but certainly I think because of a world like the one you've built, I think people want to know how the heck did that happen? Where did it come from, right? I think this could fill the whole 20 minutes. So okay, I'll try to keep let's it, do it. <laughs> relatively brief and streamlined. But um, uh, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to take me on um, uh, runs to uh, secondhand stores stores and swap meets and garage sales, which were everywhere in suburban Florida back then and probably still are. And um, I would find photos, old photos, abandoned, lost orphan pictures in, in shoe boxes. And um, I started collecting them when I was a kid. And then um, I they didn't, I didn't really, you know, uh, go anywhere with it. I just thought it was kind of an interesting, you know, way to spend a nickel that I wasn't going to buy baseball cards with. <laughs> but then when I got older, um, I was in my 20s. I had just graduated from film school. I was living in LA. And um, I discovered at like this massive legendary swap meet in Pasadena, um, a, a guy who was selling old pictures. And he was selling that like he had curated them. They were really beautifully chosen. He had amazing images, really great tastes. And I was like, whoa, there's some really amazing evocative stuff in his collection and I started buying at first it was just like for old time's sake but then I started finding a lot of uh, interesting pictures with writing on the back I would turn it over and see someone would say like this is the wall where we found a baby girl on New Year's Day 1963 whoa you know it opened up a whole universe into this little picture and I also uh, started finding pictures that reminded me of gothic horror that I had loved when I was growing up. Um, Edward Gorey, you know, strange looking kids. And um, I immediately got like two book projects in mind. One of them became um, a book called Talking Pictures, which was photos with writing on the back. And the other was Miss Peregrine. But I didn't know exactly how to make that book yet. I had a publisher in Philadelphia who specialized in cool visual pop culture uh, stuff, but not novels. They had never done one before. They had done Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, but that was 90% Jane Austen and 10% new material. So um, I took this to them and my editor was excited. And I said, I think this should be a book of poems like Edward Gorey, except instead of drawings, it's photos. And there's a creepy rhyming couplet about how the kid fell down a well. And he's like, Haha, no, you should write a novel. And I was like, really? You think I can do that? You know, it was like this, I shouldn't have needed to ask permission, but his vote of confidence uh, really helped push me into it. And so I had, you know, written short stories when I was a kid, I had, you know, loved writing, and then I got sort of sidetracked with film school. And so this was bringing together these two things I loved, telling stories with pictures, which is what screenwriting is, and, you know, wanting to be a novelist, which I had wanted to do when I was a kid. So the world came partly from the pictures, partly from ideas that I'd been developing for years in the back of my head and didn't quite know how, you know, what the outlet was going to be. And um, a lot of trial and error. Right. Wow. <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, the whole idea. I mean, I, I, I've got a box of family photos that have writing and now they're, it's largely in German, some of it, and I can read some, but it is interesting what people put on the back, you know, it's kind of a window into the history, right. Of, of your family or someone's family. Yeah. Um, that's, that's I was really glad it was someone else's family. I don't know that I want to find all the dark secrets of my own family. Right. That, yeah. <laughs> that, 
that's a that's probably a wise way, uh, approach. So, um, okay, so I'm I'm curious. So, um, in the books, um, can you take us? Um, can can you kind of take us from the beginning to um, because we're wrapping up now? So, so um, start us off for um, a viewer who hasn't read yeah. any of the books. Catch us up to speed. What happens? What are what are these stories about? So it's like 2000 pages of material or something, but essentially it's about um, a fictional version of me as a teenager, a, a teenage kid growing up in a boring suburban town in Florida where he feels kind of out of place and stifled and unextraordinary. And he, he longs for something extraordinary. And his grandfather has told him these stories, which he thinks are made up and fantastical all his life about these children who live on an island far away and you know, the sun shines every day and they never get older. And when he was little, he believed them. And then he got older and he was like, you're just fairy tales. And then his grandfather dies. And it, with his dying breath, uh, there's this traumatic thing that happens to him. This monster kills him and Jacob thinks he's dreaming it. And with his dying breath, his grandfather says, go and find the children. Basically, it's real. And so he sends Jacob on this journey through time and across the world to discover this hidden life his grandfather had led and then ultimately to discover that Jacob himself is one of the children these peculiar children and he has abilities of his own and he unlike almost any other peculiar can see the monsters can see the hollow gas through these horrible creatures who've been tormenting and pursuing the peculiars uh, for almost 100 years and so the the arc of the series follows sort of like the implosion of peculiar society as the attacks by the Hologast and their masters reaches its crescendo. Just as Jacob is discovering that he and perhaps he alone has the power to turn back the tide and, you know, help save the peculiar world. Um, and their Miss, per Miss Peregrine's home is destroyed and they're like cast out on the waves and they have to, you know, band together with all of these other peculiars and these time loops from all over the place. And that's the arc of the series without giving too much away. That's essentially where it goes. And it turns out it's much more than just one island off the coast of Wales where there's one time loop, but it's a whole world that he discovers over the course of the series. Wow. Um, so, uh Okay, so when fleshing out these characters, I'm thinking, like, how do you decide, you know, how do you come up with in which way everyone is peculiar? And, you know, did you use the photographs? Um, what were you guided by the plot of the book or some combination of all of that? Some combination. I mean, in the early books, you know, when it was a blank slate, uh, I would treat the pictures a little bit like maybe a director treats headshots when they're casting a movie you know I'd reach a scene and go okay I need I need some kids here here's a cool picture of a kid who's covered with bees I can guess what his peculiar ability might involve um, and then sometimes you know it's just a picture that I found evocative but it didn't point to anything peculiar in particular so I would make something up or something the story sort of demanded something I hadn't seen before and you know four or five books in I was getting pretty esoteric and I'm like okay I have a strong one you know I have one that can make fire like let's go deep let's do something weird and um so i just kept inventing more and more and i don't know i never stopped to count like how many peculiar children you know have been named and and pictured in the books but it's got to be like a hundred at this point oh for sure right i would think so so it seems to me i mean among other things um this series really feels like this is about the importance of family but also you know specifically about found family was that intentional on your part and can you speak to that a little bit it was definitely intentional, although I don't know that it came from any like, uh, you know, deep um, hole in my own life or anything. Um, I do come from a really small family. It's just me and my mom. And uh, I lived, I went to this magnet school that was like really far from my house. And so all my friends were at school, but I lived super far away. So I didn't see anybody in the weekends. And I was like, I felt kind of isolated and like I, you know, I needed to find my tribe so I sort of like went out and made friends with some kids in the neighborhood I'd go to summer camp sometimes I'd find my you know, find people who felt weird like me there but that's something that the character goes through in a slightly different way he 
has a family, but they don't understand him and he doesn't really fit in with them. And the story is about him finding a new family and a new home and discovering that, you know, home is where your family is. So it's the story of Jacob finding his tribe. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, and what a journey it is. So um, these books, if memory serves, came out about 10 years ago, right? If, am I remembering correctly? I feel like we're at about the decade point um, when the first Miss Peregrine came out. Um, if I'm right about that, um, can you- 10 kind of years walk- in June, I think. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I was thinking so. And I remember Cork books. I mean, I remember all of that. I remember just, it was, it, the first book was something like, I had not seen anything like it before. And I think, oh, wow. Um, you know, that was one of the many reasons it was so striking and meaningful um, to me as a reader. Um, so can you walk us through, okay, we're talking about 10 years. What have been the biggest surprises and celebrations for you in regard to publishing this series, writing these books, and then, and, and seeing uh, your stories come to life? Well, it was a surprise to me that anyone uh, read it to begin with. <laughs> it was very strange. I didn't know, I didn't understand a lot about the public, the publishing industry the beginning. And I really thought, well, we're marketing this to teenagers. I didn't mean to, I didn't necessarily set out to, but when I realized I had re- I'd written a story that was composed primarily of like 16 and 17 year olds, it seemed obvious that it should be YA. Um, and it was, but it was full of black and white photos. Right. So I was thinking, well, you know, teenagers are not going to be interested in like weird old pictures of people who've been dead forever. You know, like and the, the story doesn't know what genre it is. It, it has a big cliffhanger at the ending, and I don't know if they're going to let me write more books. So we'll see. I'll just go back to writing screenplays. No one wants to buy. Um, <laughs> so I was very surprised that it became a bestseller. Um, I was surprised that I was, you know, asked to write a second book. Uh, I was surprised that they actually made the movie. I was shocked. I really thought, like, first of all, you know, this happens to very few people and very few books and Tim Burton and it just seems super unlikely and these things fall apart all the time you know big directors have like 20 movies they're gonna make next and then they pick one and the rest fall by the wayside so that it actually happened was just like blew my mind and still does when I think back to it um many surprises over the years all of them good that's an awesome journey so, okay, let's, let's move forward. Let's move toward the end. Um, readers, uh, viewers, you're just going to have to read them all to, to find out more. Um, but okay. So tell me, can you tell us a little bit about Devil's Acre and how would you describe it to somebody who's unfamiliar or maybe visiting it for the first time? Actually, I happen to have a map of Devil's Acre right here. Okay, I don't awesome. know if this like reverses the view or whatever, but um, Devil's Acre, it, it was really fun to create this in the third book. Uh, It's a former punishment loop where they put the bad people, but then the, um, the, uh, uh, the enemies who are plotting against the good guys take it over and make it their headquarters for evil. And, um, eventually, uh, the, the forces for good win a big battle and it evict all of the bad guys. And because their homes have been largely like destroyed and their loops were raided and rendered inoperable, they have to shelter here. So, you know, our uh, protagonists and a lot of the peculiars end up, you know, making a sort of uncomfortable second home in, in Devil's Acre. So this becomes the scene for much of the final three books. We're constantly returning here. And it's um, it's a really gross but cozy old Victorian slum of, you know, in the tradition of Charles Dickens, but like worse. Um, it says the capital of cholera, the locality for criminality and it was awarded five boils by victorian slum magazine um (laughs) and you just uh you don't really want to go on there uh, you don't want to go there on vacation but the the peculiar children make a uh you know make a home of it despite its grossness right home is what you make of it right for sure um okay so one of the things that we aim to do here at, at, at NTTBF, especially since, you know, we've got all of our uh, um, teens are with us virtually, um, since um, I can't plant a teen right in front of you at this moment, what we did is we asked some, for some questions and, and I went through the questions that were oh, directed cool. at you and I had, yeah, um, so this is a real 
15. Uh, this is this question is from Isma from Jasper High School. And this okay. is what she wanted to know. Um, it, she says, um, Mr. Riggs, uh, in the book, Miss Peregrine's Home for Pe Peculiar Children. See, I don't know if it's a Texas thing. Peculiar, it's not that hard of a it word. It trips me up today. too. It's yeah, say it five times really fast. It's I, I can't even get it once. Um, she wants to know, were there any I will elements, not even attempt to do that. <laughs> were there any elements of the story that you wish the movie adaptation didn't compromise on? Yeah, um, for sure. If I feel like, you know, if the movie adaptation had followed the story a little closer, then you know, we could have a sequel that resembled the second book that might be nice um i wasn't 100 percent sure why they switched the powers of some of the peculiars but it you know none of it bothered me too too much i, I was just you know honored to have someone of tim's brilliance and stature or bring the story into his imagination and you know, someone like that has to make it their own and mold the clay a little bit. And I understand that. So, um, but like what came out of the, at the end of making that sausage resembled my book at all is pretty amazing. Um, and I've become, you know, completely comfortable with the idea that the movie and the book exist in the same universe, but they're kind of like houses down the street from one another rather than the same house, you know? Yeah, that's a good analogy. And it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful film. I'm like, I'm still very proud of it. Yeah, Not it's that very I stunning. Made it <laughs> or wrote it or anything, but. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, visually stunning for sure. And and you're right, everything you said. So they're kind of fraternal twins of sorts, right? Um, all right. So my final question for you is this. So thinking about like, again, this is 10 years of your yes. life. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a significant amount of time. How do you go about, how do you prepare yourself to say goodbye and farewell to this cast of characters who've been with you for, again, and your readers, not just you, and your readers for like nearly a decade? How do you do that? And uh, do you, that's a two-part question, and do you think that there's going to be any chance that Jacob and the Peculiars will call you back <laughs> into, into their world? I've been trying to say goodbye for uh, like five of those 10 years, but the books keep <laughs> pulling me back in. After the third book, I really thought that was it. But I really? just kept, you know, every time I would like develop a uh, take, uh, you know, on a new book and try and think of a new story and a new novel, I'd come up with something. But then I'd be like, I wonder what the kids are doing in Florida right now. You know, I, just, <laughs> I finally just had to write it. And then, of course, it had to be a trilogy because, you know, I thought the first book was going to be one book and then it was two. And then the second book didn't end the story. So there were three. And I was like, I'm not going to make that mistake again. I'm just going to commit to three and do them in a relatively truncated amount of time instead of like seven years. And uh, I managed to do that, which was, uh, which was great. And now I think I can, I can step away for a while, maybe not forever. Um, I think some people would say, I spent 10 years on that. I'm done. I never want to see it again. But I kind of feel like I spent 10 years on that. You know, I spent a long time like building this frame, the sandbox, and there it's a pretty big world. I can do a lot of things in it I can tell a lot of stories in it and you know it might be nice to use all of that kindling I spent all the time creating for uh, more stories at, at some point in the future I can tell fans that I have something up my sleeve for them that I can announce at some point maybe in the next few months okay. that I, I think they'll <laughs> enjoy not a series book but something something for the fans Awesome. I, well, I had decided on my own. I was just going to tack on a question. That's what it was going to be. So, okay. So something in the works, that's always good. And I think that's a, a really good point. Um, yeah. It, it's got such great structure. Um, you know, every once in a while you might want to dip your toe back into, into, oh, I was going to say a pool, but sandbox too. You can play in the sand a little. <laughs> so, well, um, Ransom, it's been a joy getting to chat with you and um, thank you so much for joining us at NTTBF. I, again, Hope that you'll be able to, you know, we'll hope we're all gathered in the near future and you'll be able to come back in person. But thank you for making time this afternoon. I want to remind uh, our viewers that your books are for sale in the bookstore and um, uh, there'll be a link to the books right below um, our, um, our video. And uh, we just thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.